it. I used to be in the South African police until 1994. I was in a special branch. I was a colonel. Terrorism stopped. I didn't have a job anymore. I worked for Mandela for one year. Then we moved those oaks as well. We had no more extremists. I didn't have a job. I pretended I was crazy. I went mad. I got a pension. I went home. I got divorced. I took my money and I started a marine conservation project. <laughs> Easy as that, from one ideology to the next. So, and basically what we do, um, and this is what I give to all the people that come on my boat. When I do a tour, I tell them about this and I show them a flip chart of the stuff that we actually do. So I take all the animals that we see in the bay and we go to the schools and we let them see what kind of animals that we've got in the bay and we give them various uh, things to do. That's my education manager. And then we'll get, give them, for example, design a poster depicting something from conservation. So you get 500 kids to do it, and then you pick the 10 best ones. And you only take those 10 kids out to school. In Africa, don't give anything for free. The minute you give something for free, it loses its value. And the kids think, oh, they're going to get this for free anyway. So that's one way of sifting through and making sure that you actually get the right people. Um, and then the ones that qualify, they come down to the boat. Uh, it's all a big thing. They're not often used to going to sea, and that's one of our catamarans. We take them out. We do as much as we can. We write a hell of a lot of articles, um, magazines. This is our research boat. That's my wife. She, she heads up the penguin research in Algo Bay, um, and that boat is parked next to us. So the people on the tour, they can say, you know, you guys are funding this boat. You're not funding my pocket. You're funding this boat. It's expensive to run boats. It's there. It's in their face. We do the great white shark research at Bird Island. We've been assisting scientists for 25 years. That's one of the sharks actually uh, getting a little bit too close. And that's an actually attacking the motor. It actually ripped the whole back of the engine off. The insurance company wouldn't believe me until I showed them the photographs. <laughs> um, and then we get a couple of other little juvenile uh, great whites. We get off the swimming beaches where people think they're not around. In summertime, we've got a lot of hammerheads coming into the bay. Um, and then also the mako sharks if we go right out into the current for, for bird pelagics. And then you may ask, what, uh, what is that all about? Um, every trip we do, we're using 100 litres of fuel on the boat. So we can't just say, well, that's tough. We've got to do something to lower our carbon footprint. You have to. All of us. You, you got to, what do you guys think? What am I doing to lower my carbon footprint? So we go to the uh, messed up uh, wetlands. This is a wetland. Those trees are all from Australia. We ring bark them. We cut them out. And then we plant other trees. We get the communities involved. We've got 50 people in their chainsaws and what have you. And eventually, at the end of the day, we plant trees. All right. We also tell the people on our, on our boats that for flying to Africa from Europe, you need to plant five trees. That's your carbon footprint. When you ask them, how many trees sir, have you planted? Like, mm, you know, panic, panic. But maybe they, maybe they start getting the picture. All right. Then, as far as beach cleanups go, I heard you guys doing a beach cleanup. It's very important for me to clean up a beach and not do anything with the rubbish is, is, is crazy. You actually need to follow it through. So you've got to identify. That comes from the fishing industry. So you go to the fishing industry. You show the owners, listen, this is your shit. What are you doing to fix it? All right? And we've got some really nice projects going where we're actually um, involved with the, with, the, with the squid guys and we, we, the, the owners of the boats, uh, the managers, and we actually train their, their, their cooks not to throw their stuff into the water. We go onto the SABC, uh, National News, and we kind of make it, uh, make it news. That woman there, Sylvia Earle, she's from uh, Mission Blue International, the old lady of diving. She started these hope spots around the world, and we've got six in South Africa. Our Goa Bay is one of the, probably the best run of the hope spots. Okay. So initially, when I started the Baywatch project, I was trying to fund it. I was going to people and saying, why don't you give me some money? Why don't you give me some money? And I thought, hang on, that's wrong. Let's start a business. So we started Raggy Charters 20 years ago, and we tried to run a good business to make lots of money, as much as we can, that we can fund our projects. So no one can cut off our funding. Because that's what often happens. These people that are doing the research, ah, oh, you don't want to find that research, that we're going to cut your funding off. Yeah? Isn't it a problem everywhere? So run a good business and fund yourself. This is quickly our bay. Just watch my time there. Uh, this is our Go Bay. So it's the largest bay in Africa, or one of the largest bay in Africa. And we basically are running out to St. Croix Island. That's our, we want one trip a day. We leave at half past eight. We're back at about half past 12, one o'clock. It's the longest trip in South Africa. My crew's always fresh. The skipper's fresh. We can impart all our knowledge. Nothing rushed. We can look around, nice snacks along the way quite expensive, but rather go that more little upmarket than taking twice as many people. Our whales and dolphins get one visit a day, and it's for 20 minutes. That's it. 
And the people that stay at Plett, which is a bit further down the coast from us, they've got three operators there. They're running three trips a day or four trips a day. One of the scientists said, you know, we're getting less and less dolphins here, and we, we're getting it. You guys in Ponta, you'll know that. So very limited, only one permit for the whole area. Bird Island down there, that's a full day trip, 270,000 gannets on that island. It's the largest gannetry on the planet. Then I show this to the kids, do you know what this is? And of course they don't, it's a whale. Right, Masonic kid, when the dinosaurs got wiped out, mammals popped out, they started evolving very quickly, and eventually, as you all know, those guys, the archaeo seats were the next things that developed, they still had little legs at the back. Kids love this, they, and funny, a lot of the black schools I teach, and I start telling them, they go, hi, 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 no, no, this is not right, this is not right. God, God made everything. I said, well, maybe he did, but just think about it. Quite foreign to them. That's, that's one I didn't know. That's the, uh, the forerunner for baleen. That's how the baleen plates actually started developing. And then, of course, of all the whales, and I, I go through the kids, the baleen whales, the toothed whales, the difference between them, and they seem to find that very interesting. And then just quickly, why the whales actually visit our coast, nobody seems to know that. Okay, the reason being, I'll just very briefly go through it. Southern Ocean, summertime, all right, lots of 24 hours of sunlight, lots of nutrients in the water because when the poles, when the salt water freezes, all the nutrients are given out. The nutrients feed the, the phytoplankton. Uh, the water is only two degrees, so you've got lots of dissolved carbon dioxide and oxygen in the water. Plankton boom feeds the whales, right? Whales pig that needs to give birth uh, uh, two degrees too cold has to swim all the way to the African coastline. Give birth and then start feeding. Once the baby's big enough, the calf, it swims back. That's why we get the whole cycle. The reason the males come there, why do males do anything? It's all about sex. They've got to mate with the females there because a year later they're back there. All right, that's got a one-year one gestation period. Kids think that is absolutely mind-boggling. All right, just quickly, the currents that come past. Why South Africa's got so many different kinds of cetaceans? We've got 37 out of the 80 in the world. It's because we've got a cold west coast current and we've got a warm one that side. And in between, we've got animals that only live in between the two currents. So really, really interesting. And the whales have to come. They can't go against this current. If they try and swim against their gun, this thing's doing eight kilometers. A humpback, when it's in a hurry, does eight kilometers. So they'll go backwards. So they have to come in here, and from here they split. Humpbacks first, June, July, August. They're going up, coming down in December. And then sometimes the southern rice come around about July. All right, and just to quickly a little bit, I'm sure you know all about this, why it's the, the right whale, it's the right whale to hunt. That's the, the summer concentrations, and then the, obviously the winter concentrations. Uh, we have them breaching. Kids are always asking why do they do that. Could be because they're having fun, could be to scare off predators, get rid of parasites, who knows. But they do come in very, very close into the, into the shallows. That's why they've got those short fins. They make a V-blow. Um, they've got those white callosities on their head, which they sometimes scratch around the island. They scratch their heads on the bottom. And of course the mating, um, quite, a, quite a raucous affair when you see them mating, trying to turn the female over so they can mate with them. That's the main road going past. That's Moby's dick. You see the winky sticking out the water there? It's quite a funny thing. It moves around. It's a little one looking at us. Remember cetaceans, when they look at us, they can change the shape of their lens so they can actually, don't, they don't see us as blurred. They see us absolutely perfectly. That's off the Sunday's River. You've got these beautiful sand dunes in the background there. That's a little one trying out his, trying out his baleen plates effort. And then sometimes 3% of, of whales, of southern right whales, get born white. Uh, that one we had for about a month in the bay. And it's they're usually always males. And there it's getting a little bit more sort of used to its muscles for the long swim home. That's the mother telling us not to come too close. Um, and then when they get older, they become what's called a brindled. They get that brindle shape to them. And of course, they come right up. Our, our legislation says that we can go to 50 meters, and then if they approach us, we have to remain still. They can control the approach. Humpback whales, as you can see, they've got the longest migration of any mammal, we think. That's my logo. From a, borrowed a camera on, from a woman on the boat. Um, my first bit of, I called that smoking. And this was very interesting. It came at about two meters in front of the boat. It was uh, hectic. That's why we've been teaching to do backstroke. Every year it gets a bit better. It's Port Elizabeth, our town. You can see on their tails they've got different, uh, different fingerprints. That's what we photograph. I see that one's totally different. That's where my wife does her research on the, the Penguin Island. And when you get a shot like that, go to that factory and sell them a calendar and make yourself 20,000 Rand, which is what I did, and put it back into conservation. They'll never get that picture. 
That's why they're called humpbacks, because they arch their, their tails and their backs just prior to a dive. There's one that's got a cookie cutter shark. You see that little, that little cut at the bottom? We've got the shark that latches on and spins, and these teeth actually cut this piece of meat out. That's what it... And a lot of them lately have been so flippin' scarred. Look at that one. Anyone, anyone have a guess at what that's from? It, looks, it almost looks like it's been caught in a flippin' net or something. Or maybe it gets in the way of the male mating with a female. Maybe it's the barnacles that scratch the little one while he's trying to have a look in there, you know? You see those ones too. A lot of them are coming. They're really, really marked. This was last year. Look at that one. Half of it. I mean, that's about three tons of meat that's missing off that animal. And then also always try and get your background, Port Elizabeth, or trying to show off the area. Because people, when they see these pictures, they can't believe it's, it's Port Elizabeth. That's the start to the bay. It's always a nice lighthouse in the back. Um, this was in the southern migration, a very thin, you can see it's an adult with a calf, very thin. And, just, uh, and then, of course, we also do a lot of the disentanglement, be part of that crew. That's every year we get a few more. Here's the Brutus whale, which uh, you get all the way from Durban down towards Cape Town. You've got an offshore on the west coast, and you've got an inshore variety. Um, long, thin whales, don't often see them. They can stay down for 20 minutes. They can just dis disappear. That's a lunge feed, so they come up and graze. That's they eating anchovies there. It's really nice to see that very quick. And often associated with, with um, penguins and, and gannets. They've got the three ridges on the, on the rostrum, you can see there. Um, and we also have a volunteer program, so we get our volunteers to research it. I'm trying to do my master's on it. That one is an interesting picture. It's called the eye of the eye. If you look right in the middle of that, you'll see there's the white water and there's an eye looking at you. Okay, that's the one eye and the other eye are the, um, the common dolphins that are going around and actually getting the bait ball static. And those whales, they ping it from long away where they're using a low frequency sound wave and they actually home in and then just whoop, take the whole lot. And we get these guys as well, the dwarf minke whales. These are the ones that are actually more of them before um, hunting them. Well, there's more now after that they started, before they started hunting them. And how do you see those? The dorsal fin and the blowhole will be up out of the water at the same time. Whereas the bride's whale, you'll just get the one. And for the rorquals, they've got quite a big fin in comparison to the rest of their body. But, um, yeah. And that's what we call the whale's footprint. So when a whale wants to go forward, it kicks, it's an up kick, and that up kick makes those circles which we call fo uh, whale's footprints on the boat. There's the short bailing of the, of the minke whale, because they eat quite big fish. The smaller the, 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 the prey, the bigger the baleen. When we get uh, sperm whales, this is on the current, so you go 50 kilometers off Port Elizabeth, the water's 28 degrees, and we have the sperm whales that are hunting up and down that continental shelf, which is about two kilometers They've been recorded down to two kilometers, I think. And of course, this is one that washed up. People from Bayworld, from our research institute, thought a good idea to pull it out to sea. If a big whale breaches, kill it. You can't. Once it hits the deck, you're never going to get it right. Then we've got our normal bottlenose dolphins. I always say to the kids, if you, want to, if you want to count the size of the school for every one on the surface, there's two underneath. Okay, so one there. So when you can see 50, there's actually 150 in that school. And of course, you don't need to go into the aquariums to see them performing. These guys, he's just had sex. You see his winky still out. Typical male got his show off. Uh, that's the university in the background. I sold them that picture. I paid for my kids' fees for the year. It's Happy Valley. See, I don't have spots on. It's probably a juvenile one, Angie. And Kings Beach with the new cameras these days. You can up your eyes. Uh, and these pictures, I'm trying to get artistic. I'm not very artistic, but... When it's overcast, don't think you can't take pictures. I mean, they've got some really nice um, cloud things, reflections, nice soft water. It's a little calf. You can even see the reflection of the, of the spray um, freezing the action. You've got to have pictures with the kids. And the more pictures and the less talking, I think, I think they like it. I d never want to go into videography because then I know I'm going to, have, I'm going to spend my life behind a computer. It's already bad enough with, with just, just trying to keep up with the pictures. That's the Alexandria June Field. This is the island that we go to where the penguins are. You see the dolphins often surfing around. The island looks nice with the water, water running back. A lot of foam. That's from the plankton. And then this is just, um, this is one, this was the 2nd of January last year. We put these on our Facebook pages. We had 80,000 hits because it's 
a city that people know, Port Elizabeth, we come from Port Elizabeth, it's dolphins, all right, and it's the people. And it just went it absolutely got went out of hand, which is great. People people love to associate that. Look at that. Watching them coming past. That's the beach office. It's the main beach office in Port Elizabeth. It's iconic, the um, casino. Yeah, and then um, just watching the reactions of people is nice. It's 15 halfway through. Um, have a look at that. See that on the top of the dorsal fin, there's a little thing that looks like a bit of skin. That's a uh, goose barnacle. Coronula, coronula, coronula barnacle. What's that? Stalked, stalked barnacle. That's it. Yeah, catches a rod. Doesn't actually, um, doesn't actually suck anything from the animal. And then these guys, uh, the common bottlenose dolphins. We call them the offshore. They're a bit bigger than the normal in the Pacific. They're up to about 250 kilograms. And you can see, definitely how the, the rostrum is a lot shorter. It's a more chunky animal, and the dorsal fin is is, is a slightly diff, different shape. Quite large. And they've also got different ways of moving around the boat. A little bit more like common, common dolphins beside the boat, more interaction, looking at you upside down. There's a little one when, when they're born, they've still got the little blood vessels on their head like that. And if you see that one's got like rings on it, that's from the mother contracting her uterus. So you, these, these rings last for, for a couple of weeks. When photographing dolphins, one thing I have found is don't think you can look through your camera and take a picture. You've actually got to look over your camera. So you've got to get used to like those, those machine guns with the helmets and stuff. You actually work like that. So as it's coming out, you, and eventually you get it right. You can actually point, point it really cool. That one's got a birthmark on. You see the calf there? Nice to get pictures like that. Feel really exciting. That guy, um, the reason dolphins form schools, anyone know? Stop predation. Like, right? if, you're in a, if you're in a group, you've got more chance of fending off shark attacks. And apparently, someone was telling me, was it, was it you, Roy, that they go for the livers. They actually they, they bash the, the, the sharks in at the liver and that makes them move off. This one wasn't so lucky. Can you see the gray? That's probably a great white. You can see the tooth marks around there. Normally, the great whites bite the back of the tail off and then they can eat the rest of the individual. So. And then we get these guys, the humpback dolphins. These are the ones that get caught in the shark nets in the towel. Um, they come, as you can see, very close inshore. When they get older, they get that kind of sort of uh, more kind of whitey look to them. Um, never got a picture of one breaching. I don't know how. And they come right into the harbor. They're also known as the harbor, harbor dolphins. And then these guys, the long beaked common dolphin. You get long and short beaked in the world. Uh, we've got the long beak, and they're generally found a little bit further offshore. Uh, there's one with a, with, a, with a calf, probably a mother and an auntie. And often they're the ones that will swim in front of the, uh, of the boat. We call that chasing the rainbow. Um, you get big schools going past the islands. It's perpetual motion. You've got up to 3,000 of these animals in a school at once, and the noise is absolutely it's deafening. Like a, like a normal dolphin on steroids. They just, apparently the spinners are even nicer, but we, I've never seen a spinner in, in the bay yet. And this was, we had the BBC out doing a thing called IMAX. Um, they were filming a thing for this 40 meter screen, which was eight meters high. And we managed to get the catamaran full taps in front of 2,000 of these dolphins peeling out the wave. So must have looked really, really nice on the, on the big screen. Killer whales we get, we get the transient variety. Transient means now they're here, now they're not. Sometimes you'll see them three, four, five, six times in a year. Sometimes we won't see them for three years. And really amazing to, to interact with. They sometimes get a bit aggressive. That female was actually landing like that and splashing water over the boat. Uh, that was the male. You can see, look on his chest, you can see he's got marks on there. He's probably been beaching himself somewhere. You know, I was in Peninsula Valdez last year where they actually come on and eat the, um, eat the seals. That's a female. You can see shorter dorsal fin than the male. It's off Schoonmarker's cock in Port Elizabeth. Uh, that was another big male that we saw on its own. Also, they use the fin to identify them. This was one that was attacked, uh, attacked and uh, killed a bottlenose dolphin. Uh, see, see in the water there? Just one shot with the tail, one that was lagging behind, bang, poof. Risso's dolphin, the largest dolphin that's not called a whale, because it doesn't get over four meters. 
Then we've got the Cape fur seals, South African fur seals now. Uh, they live on, on black rocks, which is the eastern extremity um, of, their, of their distribution. Um, and that is in front of my house. You get these big bulls that just come in, they're a little bit tired. And, and that's where they live on black rocks. And this is where you get the great white sharks. They come in winter because these, the pups are learning to swim and the sharks come in easy pickings. And they, they thermoregulate, so they pop their fins out the water, heat up nicely. That's them eating electric ray. Electric ray, they generate like electricity. Shouting into the little one, not sure what that one did. And that one, you can see, just seen a great white shark. Get, get out of there. And then we go into the penguins quickly. This is a, a juvenile, so it hasn't become an adult yet. I took that picture in 2002, and since then we've lost 66% of our penguins. That's what it looks like now. So we were so alarmed by that, they brought in uh, Dr. Lorian Pettigrew, who I subsequently married, and she came and did all the research um, on the penguins to see why their numbers were decreasing. What was the contributing factor? Uh, and you know, if penguins are indicator species, so if penguin numbers are going down, what about the stuff that you actually can't study? So she puts these little GPSs on, we, we, we put it on the, on the adult when, they, when they're nesting, and off it goes to sea. Just a quick one, that was the, 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 the area that's in a circle like that, that was the proposed closure to fishing boats, guys catching anchovies and sardines. That was the proposed, but that year they were allowed to fish anywhere. Look how far the penguins went. They went up to 90 kilometers to get food for their chicks. The following year, 2009, no fishing boats were allowed in that circle, and Bird Island was your control island. So that was just in case your, your conditions changed. And look what happened. Look at that. Take the fishing boats out of the equation. They're all fishing within the proposed reserve. Because of our research, the government has now decided, the minister, when she stops picking her nose, probably she can sign it, but the new reserve will go all the way from St. Croix to Bird Island. It will become a big marine protected area, no takes out. We tell our clients on the boat, listen, from this trip, we're funding that boat, and this is the kind of research you guys are helping us actually get somewhere with this. Um, that's a little research boat. We've got quite sophisticated sonars on there, and we ride those transects twice a month. The government does it once a year and works out the fishing quotas. We're doing it twice a month. And we're funding that, or the people on our boat. That's what happens when, you're, when, the, when your penguins don't get food. That's them going on a hunting party. I've got seven minutes. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a little, not an albino, the cystic one. That's penguins doing what's called a bait ball. So they go around and they get all the fish into the middle like that. That was moonrise on the island. It's the most amazing island to, to go and work on. You get these incredible sunsets. Um, it's just... It's really great. And we've got this fellow who's a Cape Gannet. As I said, we've got the largest gannetry in the world on, on, um, on Bird Island. And to see these guys feeding is just absolutely incredible. They can hit the water at up to 100 kilometers an hour. And the only reason they don't break their necks is they've got airbags underneath the skin. And that absorbs the shock as they go in. These guys can fly all the way from Bird Island to Mossel Bay. 400 kilometers, get food bring it back, feed the chicks. Penguins can't do that. All right? They can only do after anything more than about 60 kilometers, they start digesting their food. That's right in Port Elizabeth uh, on the beachfront, dive bombing. So we've got an amazing amount of nutrients in the bay. Uh, we've got very productive plankton systems. And of course, these guys coming into land, I call that gannet air breaks. And then we do a pelagic bird cruise as well. Get the white chin petrels. Uh, they're really nice to see. This was about 80 kilometers out to sea. Uh, it was a nice five meter swell running and no wind, which is very almost unheard of. So we were getting these really crazy conditions that, that bird lovers would just go absolutely mad about. And that was the swell. I was on the boat, there was a trough, and then there was a bird coming to land on the next one. This is a guy just dipping his wing in. Um, I thought I'd missed that. Albatrosses, we get about six different species. This is an Indian yellow-nosed albatross, um, a juvenile. And we also get shy, we get uh, black-browed, we get grey-headed. Um, so, so lovely, beautiful birds. I get so excited, and sometimes the guests don't really think it's so cool, you know, but to me, an albatross is just, <laughs> wow, that's a shy. See the underwings, very thin black margin. 
It's a giant petrel, the northern giant petrel, real mean buggers. These are the ones that chase lots of seabirds. They just, just swoop on the, on, the, on the storm petrels. And then just quickly, this is TV crews that are coming out from England. We've had six uh, BBC film crews. We had National Geographic, European ones. They come out and they film this. And you can't get Port Elizabeth people to come out to see. You want to pull your hair out. And the people say, oh, we didn't know, we didn't know. But this is kind of the stuff that the people in P are missing. Bait balls, sardine run. I mean, it starts March, April, May, uh, into about June. That's a Bridewell on its side. Here we've got two. We've got a bait ball going here. We've got another bait ball going there. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a place. Algoba is the place to be. Almost there. a little bit quicker and this is dolphins learning to fly you see we're going back the other way now they're starting to evolve flight and commons that's the bride's well finishing it all off then we got this red tide uh, we've had a huge problem with this i think it was it was brought in by a by a ship in the ballast you know ships bringing ballast water they pump it out they've got this red tide it's becoming a huge problem in port elizabeth now uh, we've had it for two three months at a time we get these guys called a rainbow. If you ever come into PE and you go to the airport, have a look. I managed to smoke over their guys' corpse and we managed to got that thing put up. This is the last series of pictures. This is, um, this is the Alexandria June field. Um, look at this backdrop. Nowhere else in the world are you going to find shots. Of it. All these pictures were taken in one day, on one trip. I mean, it would, it's taken me 20 years to get pictures, anything like that. And just one of those days, it started cooking. There's the red tide coming into it. Um, look at that, I mean, the contrast. It's not a desert, it's an actual dune field. So it's mobile, and that's where the early, if you look at those shell middens at the back there, that's where the early people in South Africa were not black people, they were the koi, and they subsisted on eating uh, shellfish along the, along the coastline, and they'd put all the shells into like a, 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 what's called a midden, and bits of broken pots and that kind of stuff. Um, that's yin and yang opposites and that's the woody cape it's the end of the bay you can see the different uh, layers it's the, uh, the the coastal forest I mean you've got coastal forest right right on the top of the cliffs that's what it looks like at the bottom and there's our little drone so we've got this whole thing on a on a on a video that Janet if <laughs> that's we got stuff. this was a stranding two three weeks ago of common dolphins and this was getting towards <coughs> Also, we don't often go out in the afternoon, so to get the dolphins in the evening is, is like really cool. Get those reflections. If I wasn't color blind, I'd maybe enjoy the colors there. Unfortunately, I am. And because of this, on these great pictures, and we have 28,500 dolphins that use the bay, we launched it as the bottlenose dolphin capital of the world. Nowhere else in the world. The closest is Australia. There's a bay there with 4,000 bottlenose dolphins for six months of the year. So we're miles ahead. That's the Minister of Tourism, Minister uh, Port Elizabeth, in charge of, of, of tourism, Eastern Cape Parks, myself, we made this commemorative um, little jobby. And we've won um, two, two national tourism awards for the best beach, ocean, and something, something marine experience in South Africa. So we're doing something right.